let's go ahead um, and get started. And if people come in, they come in. Um, so again, if you're just now getting here, hello and welcome. It's so good to see all your names popping up tonight. Um, if you have questions for Brent tonight, you can type them in the Q&A box. Um, we will get to as many questions as we have time to answer in an hour. And if we don't get to your question, we'll take note of your question and we'll get in touch with you um, after tonight with the answer to your question. Um, so that's kind of the logistics of it all. And just so everybody knows, we are recording this and um, it is being broadcast to YouTube and will be put up on the Friends YouTube channel. Um, so I hope that you're all comfortable with that. But if you're not, now you know and you can do what you need to do. Um, and then also there will be, um, we'll you know, post this on our, on our website, Facebook page. If you wanted to show anybody later or see it later, um, it will be recorded. Um, so having said all that, I'll say one more time for those of you just coming in that we um, would like for you to answer or ask your questions by typing it into the Q&A box that you'll see at the bottom of your screen um, and we'll get to as many as we can. So I am so excited. I guess, well, I should tell you first, I think most of you know me, but I'm Katie Fleming, the Community Engagement Director at Friends of the San Juans. And I'm getting pretty used to uh, seeing just your names pop up and I just, yeah, have so much hope for 2021 that we might be able to see each other in person again. But for tonight, we'll do it this way. Um, so I am really, really um, excited to introduce Brent Lyles to you, our new executive director at Friends of the San Juans. He's been with us for about three months now, and um, I, I feel so fortunate that he is um, our new director and we're having a good time. And I know he has so much to tell you, and I'm really happy that um, the rest of you are just as excited to meet him and ask him questions and get to know him in this virtual format for now until we can be together in person. So I'm not gonna say anything else because you're here tonight to learn from Brent. So having said that, I will hand it over to you, Brent. Well, thank you so much, Katie. And I wanna appreciate the folks who are showing up tonight for this town hall to ask questions and get to know me and get to know what's been going on lately at Friends of the San Juans. I wanna start with our acknowledgement that we always do that we reside on the ancestral lands and waters of the Coast Salish people who have called this area home since time immemorial. Uh, they have a long history of stewardship of these lands and waters and, and that stewardship continues today. And it's been so fun and humbling and exciting for me to find my place in that history of stewardship as I've arrived here as well. You know, I, it was funny because we were talking about questions that were coming in the other day. And um, the one that really made me giggle was the one says, it, the question was, what's your deal? <laughs> and it was, it was funny because it made me think, well, I don't know, what is my deal? <laughs> you know? um, so I actually, I wanted to start with that because I, you know, I, the way I take that is sort of like, how did you get here? And like, what are you doing here? Um, and I was going to share a couple of moments from my life that sort of led to where I am today. And, you know, my very first memory of, of having some sort of environmental consciousness, I, it, it, I must have been like five or six years old. And I remember being in my dad's office and right above his desk, and I'm pretty sure his desk was like a piece of plywood that was on two by fours. Right above his desk was this poster and it was Charlie Brown and Snoopy. And Charlie Brown says to Snoopy, what are you gonna do about global warming? And, and so this is like mid seventies, right? And, and Snoopy has a little question mark bubble above his head. And Charlie Brown says, well, you're the head beagle. You're supposed to do something about these things. And, and Snoopy just cries and bawls. And down at the bottom of the poster, it says, why cry? Let's try. And you know, and actually what's really fun is that I found that poster in a box a couple of years ago and I had it framed for my office. But I love that sentiment. I love that sentiment of not getting paralyzed by the fear and you know, really kind of moving forward in a hopeful way. And that's something that I I, I love about that message and something that I bring to my work. Um, you know, fast forward many years later, right after I 
graduated from college was another experience that for me really changed my life and and set me on the path that I'm on now. When I graduated from college, I, I was and I, I was a science nerd. I was kind of a math and science nerd all the way through high school and college. And I I joined this brand new program that no one had heard of yet called Teach for America. And if you're not familiar with that program, it's a little bit like a domestic peace corps where they they take recent college graduates and they send them into high needs areas to teach public school. And so I joined Teach for America and found myself teaching middle school science and math in a tiny little town called Henderson, North Carolina. And it's right in the middle of the tobacco fields. And um, I, I don't think this is true, still true today, but at the time, Vance County, North Carolina was the poorest county in the poorest state. And for me, I mean, I didn't grow up with a lot of wealth, but to land, you know, find myself in that town and, you know, and when you, when you teach in a rural area, you get to know your students and you get to know the families. And I had never experienced poverty firsthand like I did in, in, in Henderson, North Carolina. And I was there for two years and, you know, it changed me. And I, and I don't think you can go through an experience like that, seeing the inequity in my own country, right? Um, without wanting to do something about it. And, and, that's, and that's the path that I've been on ever since. I've been working in nonprofit organizations and fighting the good fight and trying to save the world. Um, I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and grew up in the Midwest and, and bounced around a little bit, a couple different um, jobs and whatnot. I, I come to the San Juan Islands from Austin, Texas, and I've been in Austin. I had been in Austin for about 25 years. And, and, and it was these threads of science and science education and environmental education, because that's the other thing that I got out of that experience with Teach for America was, was believing in the power of science education and environmental education. And that's, and that's been my career. I've written science textbooks. I've, I've done fundraising for bats. I had a great conversation a few months back with Russell Lofrick. We had about the bats of the San Juan Islands. That was a lot of fun. I'm totally off topic there. But, um, you know, as I, as I think about my role at Friends of the, of the San Juans, my most recent executive director role in Austin, Texas, was for an organization called the Colorado River Alliance. And the Colorado River Alliance had a lot of similarities with Friends of the San Juans. If you, if you, if you're, if you haven't been to Austin, there's a river that runs right through the middle of the city, and it's the Texas Colorado River. And that organization was dedicated to the long-term vitality of that river. And it's this organization, and, and this will sound familiar, right? It's this organization developed, devoted to environmental stewardship and, and, and the issues that are involved with that, like how the land affects the water and vice versa, you know, the competing interests of, uh, of, of farms and landowners and, you know, corporate entities and, and agencies and the wildlife and threatened and endangered species. And, the organization was about coalition building and it was about facing the challenge of these multiple issues. Um, a big one was talking about protecting this natural resource in the face of rapid development. And so as I've come to Friends of the San Juans, it has really felt like I'm right at home. Um, and, and I'll get to questions in just a second, but there's one more thing I wanted to say. There's kind of a misconception that I came here for this job. And I actually came here first and then got the job. I, my, my history of this with the San Juan Islands is that my, my wife used to live here um, when she was uh, like 12 or 13 years old, uh, where she was growing up in Southern Oregon, a friend, a friend's family moved to Orcas Island. And so she started visiting. And she's been visiting ever since. And then when she and I got together, which was about 12 years ago, you know, she was like, oh, you got to come see this place. And I came here and, of course, completely fell in love with the San Juan Islands. And that's, this is where we've been coming for vacation. 
And a couple of years ago, I think my son was a, a sophomore in high school at the time. We were here visiting. And you know, you know, my, my son's graduation was on the horizon and we were talking about where we would go next because we'd both been kind of ready to get out of the city for a while. And um, I, was, I was standing with my wife on the top of Turtleback Mountain and we were looking around going, okay, we've been talking about all these places where we might go live after Walter graduates. Why aren't we moving here? And, and, that, and that was all she wrote. And so we, we've been planning for the last year or two to come to the San Juan Islands. And then, boy, I tell you, when this job opened up with Friends of the San Juans, it, was, it really felt like the stars were aligning. Um, and, and, and my, 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 my in-person interview was two days after I had arrived with my U-Haul truck and my wife and my dog and my cat and all my stuff. And, um, you know, I just, I just fell in love with the organization immediately. Um, and here I am. And it's just such an honor. I've been so impressed with the staff and with the board and with the community and the members. Um, and I, I want to thank everybody for joining in tonight. And, um, you know, I think I think it's time to turn to some questions. Katie, what have we got in terms of questions? Okay, yeah, great. We do have some. And again, just as a reminder for folks who came in, if you have a question for Brent, go ahead and write it in the Q and A um, box. It's right, you know, on the very bottom of your screen. You'll see the two little chat bubbles, and you can write your questions in there. Okay, well, to get started tonight, Brent. Um, well, why not start with COVID? Because you know. <laughs> It's the overarching thing right now. Um, so a question is, in what way has COVID impacted the finances for 2020? And um, just kind of a follow on of that, has COVID changed the amount of donations or other funding significant, significantly? Oh my gosh, that's, that's a great question. So thank you for sending that question in. You know, I wanna start with how COVID has affected Friends of the San Juans in general, I mean, I, um, you know, I think for some lucky folks out there, COVID has kind of been, oh, you know, we're taking it seriously. I don't, but I don't know anybody who's had it, right? Like, you know, it was a friend of a friend on Facebook or something like that. And, you know, here at Friends of the San Juans, both for our staff and our board, uh, we've been personally affected by this. Um, and it has been very real. And it has impacted our families in profound and, and life-changing ways. Um, and so for us, you know, this, is, this has been, you know, <laughs> the regular safety precautions and stuff that you take, like, you know, it's, it's really real for us. Um, and of course, it's changed how we do work, right? We've, we're working from home for the most part. You know, we come into the office a little bit, but it's sort of like, oh, is you know, is anyone going in on Tuesday? Cause I need to go in on Tuesday and sanitizing everything and, and all of that. But, you know, it's really changed how things get done. Um, you know, we have, we have weathered this storm and I'll get to the finances in just a second. Um, you know, I, I think when all of this started happening a lot of nonprofits were just trying to keep the wheels on the bus and and, and that was us too, you know, it was sort of like, wow, how do we adjust to this and how do we keep doing our work in this new context? And, um, and it's been tough, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. One of the things that's really amazed me, and, and of course I wasn't here for a lot of that, right? So I'm, 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 I've been part of this for the last three months you know, not for Friends of the San Juans, not only have we kept the wheels on the bus, but the bus has been cruising. I mean, I think it's remarkable how much work has gotten done and how, how much our programs have advanced over the course of this last year when everything's shut down and we're having to adjust to all this, this, this new reality. Um, but, but Friends is really, made striking progress. I mean, just the idea, like the, we have this, this project we recently completed on Susha Island, which is a, a restoration project that has been seven years in the making. And, and, and the, the, just the sheer fact that that was able, that we were able to bring that to fruition 
and achieve this project during this time is just remarkable. Um, and, and it's just a real credit to the staff at Friends of the San Juans. Um, and so how has it affected the finances? You know, I, in, in terms of our expenses, it's, you know, it's kind of a mixed bag, right? Like there's things that cost a little bit more and things take a little bit longer. So there's more time, uh, more staff time that's dedicated to projects um, in many cases. Um, and at the same time, there are things that cost less. Like a lot of our work having a regional presence in the Salish Sea is about attending meetings and attending conferences and participating in policy making decisions and policy making processes. And those have been virtual. So our cost to travel to go to those has been a lot less. And, um, you know, so, the, so on the expense side, it's really, there's, a, there's pluses and minuses. Uh, and then there's revenues, right? There's fundraising. And, um, you know, like I say, when all of this started, like a lot of nonprofits, we were just trying to get our feet under us. And, you know, for us, it, it, like this is a community and our members, many of them are folks who've been with us for decades. And so when we were thinking about coronavirus and how this was affecting us, it, you know, the question was not, well, will our donors renew our, their membership, right? Um, you know, the question was, are our donors okay? You know, and so as we, as we went into March and April, you know, we were on the phone checking in with people. Um, and you know, what, what's going on with you? Has this impacted you? You know, at, do, you, do you need anything? You know, conversations like that. And um, I just, I'm, I, I, again, I, I, I'm, I wasn't here for that, but my gosh, I have such respect and admiration for how Friends of the San Juans um, was able to reach out to its community and, and, and build community through this very difficult time. Um, and, and yet the fundraising still has to happen, right? And um, I, think a, I think a mistake that a lot of nonprofits make is, is that they somehow think that their mission or their work isn't as important. And, and it's not that there aren't urgent needs out there in the community, because there absolutely are. But our mission is still incredibly relevant and the challenges that we face at Friends of the San Juans and, and, and I mean the challenges that we address through our programming the challenges in the community and and the work that we do is is more important than ever and so you know we were able to bring that message and say yes there's a lot of needs out there in the community and this work continues and we're still out there we're still doing these programs and the restoration projects and the policy discussions and the you know virtual reality education and all of the programming that we do it's still happening and and we hope that you'll be able to support us and you know were there some donors who said look i gave all my money to the food bank and i you know i got to i got to take a pause this year from supporting friends of the san juans absolutely and we absolutely we respect that right like that's I, you know thank you for 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 leaning in and supporting the community like that. Um, and I'm pleased to report that our, our members have stepped up and our board of directors have stepped up and our fundraising has been going okay. Um, is it a normal year? It is not a normal year. Um, are we gonna end the year in the red? Um, it might be kind of a near thing, you know, we're, this is, this is a big fundraising time for us right now. So we're waiting to see what comes in, or, you know, or this week and next week and so on. Um, but I, I've just, I've really, I've, I've, I've developed this deep appreciation for the tenacity and the passion of our members because they, they really are stepping up. Um, and, and we are so lucky, uh, you know, I, I've had some conversations lately and, you know, there's nonprofits that are folding and going out of business because of this. And, and Friends of the San Juans has been so um, 
so fortunate in so many ways. We haven't had to lay off staff. We haven't, you know, our work has really continued with gusto during this time. Um, and I also want to, you know, give some credit to my predecessors and the board of directors because we do have some money in the bank for kind of the rainy day fund, you know. So if we if we come in in the red, we'll be okay. Um, and that's that's not true of every nonprofit. There's certainly, you know, I, I think, you know, having funds set aside for a rainy day is is has shows a lot of foresight. Um, but anyway, has there been impacts for us? Yes. Um, are we okay? We are. And and for those of you on this call right now who've supported us during this time, thank you, because you've helped us keep doing the work that we do. Katie, what's our what's another question? Okay, next, next one. What's going on with the comp plan update and its friends involved? Yes, we are very much involved. Actually, I, I have to admit that this is something that I've been really enjoying lately. So the, for those of you who don't know the, the lingo, comp plan is short for the San Juan County Comprehensive Plan. It's a periodic planning process that the, the county goes through uh, periodically. And like there's a lot of land use discussions about how the county will manage its natural resources and its land and its development, you know, in the coming years. And so, of course, this is something that is has enormous implications for our San Juan Islands communities. And, and I want to I want to pause just to say that 40, 41 years ago, when Friends of the San Juans got its start, it was initially organized around the first comprehensive plan for the county. Um, and, and, and there were a group of people who said, hey, our decisions about how we manage our land and how we manage our natural resources are really important and have implications for the future. And they got together and that's how Friends of the San Juans was created. And so the answer is yes, absolutely. We are involved with the comp plan today. And uh, you know the, the current process is that the sausage is getting made right now. And we have several people on staff who've been involved with comp plan in the past. Um, and we're meeting on a weekly basis to hear what the latest staff reports from the county are saying and, and, and try to make sure that, you know, things like, um, the, the rural character that we love about San Juan County is protected and that the natural resources are protected and, you know, that the critical areas for wildlife species and aquifer re recharge and, and, and all of that, like that, that as the county moves through this process, that we want to make sure that every opportunity is being taken to protect those natural resources and, and think really strategically about the, the long-term use of land um, in this county. Uh, and I say it's been a lot of fun, but because for me, you know, of course, as the new executive director, I'm coming in and it's all about the learning curve, right? It's all about learning the different programs and so on. And man, I have just jumped in the deep end in terms of the comp plan. I am, you know, attending the planning commission meetings as an observer, and I've been meeting with staff every week to talk about what's going on and well, should we comment on this and should we submit some questions about that? And, and it's and it's been such fun for me to learn about the county and learn about the issues that we face and the challenges that we face, and and see the creativity, um, and not just on my side with friends of the San Juans, but also the planning commission. I've loved hearing the way they're thinking about this. Um, you know, it's some really talented and thoughtful individuals volunteering their time to serve on the planning commission. Um, so yeah, comp plan is happening. And in the new year, uh, in the early months of 2021, there's gonna be a lot more opportunity for public input on that. And so you'll be hearing a lot from friends of the San Juans as we, as we go through that process and we'll be sharing what our priorities are and what our talking points are and encouraging our community to get involved with the comp plan and, and to make their voices heard as well. Okay, thank you, Brent. Okay, so what are the two or three top projects for 2021? 
Oh gosh, I, I'm only allowed to pick two or three. Okay, let me think for a second. You know, I mean, the things that come immediately to mind for me, I, and, and so when a new executive director arrives, especially at an organization that's been around for such a long time, there's a lot of questions about like, okay, so what's his agenda, you know? And like, what's he doing coming in here from Texas? You know, like, you know, what does he know about us? And I, and as I've arrived and I've started to learn, you know, my first, my, the, the first thing I did was I, I called it my listening tour because I immediately started setting up meetings with partners and agency representatives and of course our board and and former board members and staff and 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 really listening to what people had to say you know i believe that friends of the san juans is doing important work that meets real community needs and so like i'm i'm not coming in thinking oh we're totally going to turn this organization and inside out and, and we're going to do to something totally different that's not it at all you know, what I'm looking for is what's our strategy and, and how are we thinking about the next five years in terms of meeting the most pressing needs of the community? And so when the question is, you know, what are, what are the three priorities? Um, there's a couple of things that immediately, immediately come to mind. Like one of them is, uh, well, it's kind of behind the scenes and sort of nerdy. So I'm not sure if I don't know if any of y'all are going to care about this. It's not very sexy, but but kind of getting our ducks in a row internally. Right, like this was a really good opportunity to look at our personnel policies, for example. Uh, they needed reviewed and they needed refreshed and they needed brought up to date with best practices. Um, internal financial controls and policies and procedures, we've been spending a lot of time on that in the last month or so and, and making sure that we're using best practices there as well. Like, you know, it, we wanna make sure that, that we are functioning effectively and efficiently as an organization, right? And so there's been a lot of focus on that. And I wanna thank the board and the staff because they have, it's not just me doing this, right? Like this has been a group effort and, and we've really been um, spending our time and doing it right. And I'm, I'm really excited about what's coming out of that. In fact, our, our board of directors is meeting tomorrow to uh, review the, the latest and hopefully final draft of our personnel policies. So anyway, that's the first thing, right? Getting our ducks in a row. Um, the second thing is about focus and priorities. You know, something that Friends of the San Juans has done really well over the years is that it's responded to opportunities. And when, when a new challenge arises, you know, a new challenge arises, Friends of the San Juans is on it, you know, and it's kind of like, all right, let's do this. And 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 that has been such a strength of the organization. And, and the flip side of that is that over time, you end up doing a lot of different things. And, 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 and there's a little bit of that sense of kind of doing all things to all people. And I'm excited to go through a formal and thoughtful strategic planning initiative. We are gonna be launching that in the early part of 2021. This is gonna be the board and staff. And we're going to be getting community input on that as well. But it's a ch chance for this organization to look ahead and look at the environment, look at the context for our work and, and look at what we're doing and, and decide what are the most important things to focus on, on the next, uh, over the next couple of years. Um, and our time horizon for this planning initiative is probably about five years. Not only is, gonna, is, is that going to help us focus our work, but we can identify what's the measurable change that we want to achieve, right? You know, how are we going to incorporate the science? How are we going to incorporate the data into what we're doing so that we really know that we're moving the needle? Um, so that's, that, that's the second thing for me is, is bringing focus to the organization. And, you know, and a lot of people, um, you know, ask me, well, what are you going to have the organization do? And like, I'm really, I mean, I have my own ideas. I'm excited to, to think about what this organization can do uh, to address climate change. For instance, we're in this very interesting geographic area and, you know, it, we have a role to play in, 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 in the fight for climate. And, um, but I, I just, I'm, I'm excited about uh, hearing what the community has to say and seeing what priorities emerge from those discussions. 
Um, so we'll be sharing more information about that and sharing opportunities to get involved with our strategic planning again in the early part of 2021. Uh, so getting our ducks in a row, focus. I think the third thing that comes to mind immediately is communication. You know, there's a lot of misunderstanding in this community about who Friends of the San Juans is and what we do. Um, you know, I think very few people out there understand the, the breadth of our impact. And we do a lot of different, we do a lot of different things. Um, and if people are not understanding that, then it's about communication. Um, and, uh, you know, Katie and I and the rest of the team have been talking a lot about communication in 2021 and what that can look like and, you know, what social media and email and our website and like, you know, what can we do? What are we doing well? And what can we, what can we do differently that'll help people really understand with what we, help, help people understand what we do and then also engage more meaningfully and, and more consistently in what we do. Because this is not work that we do in isolation, right? When it's not just the friends and it's not just the staff and board of friends kind of making these decisions and doing stuff, right? We are, we are powered by our members and, and we wanna make sure that we are communicating really well with our members and with the full community and, and helping our members get engaged in a way that's really gonna make a difference. All right, let's get to the next question, Katie. Thank you. All right. So what is your greatest challenge in understanding the environmental issues of the San Juan Islands? What is the greatest challenge in understanding the environmental issues of the San Juan Islands? Your greatest challenge. Oh, my great, my, my greatest challenge personally. Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. I, this is going to be kind of, I, it's going to sound like a cop out of an answer, but I am such a science nerd that like if I could spend 24 hours a day just learning about the marine ecosystems and all the interactions and the microclimates all over the Salish Sea and across the, you know, San Juan Islands and like, like I would love to do that. And I, and I, and there's just not enough hours in a day. Um, and so, <laughs> so I've had to, sort of had to balance my learning with doing my job, um, you know, and then when I, when I go home at night, I'm like right now I'm reading a, a book about salmon recovery um, in, my, in my spare time. Um, so, I, you know, I, I just, I want to I wanna jump in and start getting to work. And yet there's also this learning curve and sort of balancing that has been a, a challenge for me. Um, I think the other piece of it, and this is, and this is a challenge um, for, friends of the San Juans and the whole scientific community is that there's just so much we don't know. Um, I was listening to a talk the other day by Joe Gatos over at the CEDOC Society, and, and, and he was talking about the number of species of birds that aren't even well studied, right? And that's so true across the marine ecosystems. There's so much that we don't know, and things are changing so fast that, that having the science to guide you in your priorities when there's so many gaps um, is, is really a challenge. And, and certainly CEDOC Society and Quiot and Friends of the San Juans have been doing a lot of scientific work over the last 40 years to fill in those gaps. And yet there's still so much that we don't know. Um, and it's exciting. I, you know, like I say, I, I love learning all that stuff. So it's been a lot of fun for me to try to get caught up Okay. So are you learning more about the various environmental organizations statewide in Western Washington, the Salish Sea, and then obvious ways to leverage the impact through community engagement and partnerships? Okay. I mean, I got to about the first part of the question that I didn't listen to the second part. So tell me the second part again. <laughs> so basically, are you learning more about all the other groups and organizations that are out there in the state and in the region? And then what are the ways, basically, the obvious ways to leverage the impact through community engagement and partnerships? To leverage it. I'm writing a note to myself. So let me start with the other organizations that are out there. You know, it's funny because like I say, I was planning to move to the San Juan Islands for a while now. And I actually started about a year ago reaching out to all of these different organizations that are doing environmental work because I knew I wanted to come here and I wanted to do environmental work. So, you know, Friends of the San Juans was on the list, but, you know, I reached out to so many different organizations and had these great conversations. It was, it was so, um, people were so welcoming to this, you know, weirdo, 
from from Austin, Texas to like get on the phone and go, yeah, let's have a talk about this. So, you know, I talked to the the, the land bank and the San Juan Preservation Trust and Quiat and CDOC Society. And like, you know, it, I was learning about all of these organizations even before I came aboard here at Friends of the San Juans. And then once I've got here, it's been so uh, gratifying to find out how many of them we partner with. Like we've got all of these different projects with all of these different organizations. And of course, it's not just the, the nonprofits, right? It's the agencies as well. Um, and uh, that's, that's the answer is yes. I've been, I've been reaching out to all these folks and, um, you know, I just reached out to San Juan Preservation Trust the other day about something. And so anyway, that's all of that. All of that is in motion. And, you know, we're, as we go into our strategic planning process, we wanna make sure that we are finding the partnerships that are gonna make the most difference and also not step in on other people's toes, right? Like we don't want to duplicate work that's already being done really well and really competently out there. Um, you know, and then in terms of the, the ways to leverage communication, you know, if I, if I um, understand that, that question, right, I, you know, I, I sort of, I, I hear it partly about leveraging those partnerships and, and communicating about those partnerships. And, you know, absolutely. Like, you know, we, we, we just recently um, had some success partnering with the San Juan Preservation Trust. And, you know, we've been doing work for years and years on shoreline restoration and the way the two organizations are able to work together is that we are able to help San Juan Preservation Trust, we, we're able to use the science to help San Juan Preservation Trust identify tracks of shoreline that are especially valuable for the long-term preservation, for the conservation easements that they can put in place in partnership with the land bank. So that's, a, that's an example of, of, of a partnership that works really well and, and has had success um, recently. And, and um, you know, communication. We are we are learning the the. I'm I'm not saying anything. It's too surprising when I say that the internet is changing by the day, right? And there's so many neat new tools out there for communication that we can leverage to help us um, get the word out and and increase engagement. And so one of the things we've been talking about lately, you know, we do a lot of action alerts, right? Where we ask our members to make a comment about this or you know have your voice heard over here. And there's a lot of powerful software out there that can help that happen more easily and kind of make that a smoother action so that it's easier for our members to weigh in and, and, and to have their voices heard. And so we've been exploring that. Um, thank you for asking that question. Yeah. Okay, let's give you kind of a, give you a break for a minute. How are you finding the transition to a wet and cool environment, a maritime climate from whatever Texas was? <laughs> whatever it was from, from whatever texas was whatever it was like down there you know it's funny i was actually talking to some family down in austin the other day and i looked up the weather and it was 45 degrees here and it was 48 degrees there so it wasn't that different um but that being said austin's a lot warmer you know it's been fine i i was um born in pittsburgh pennsylvania which is second only to seattle in the number of rainy days per year you know i I'm not sure if that's actually true. I heard that somewhere. I hope that's true. But, you know, it's a cloudy, rainy place um, with a lot of a lot of dreary days. Um, I come here and honestly, it feels like home. There was a way that I mean, I love Austin. Austin is a lot of fun and um, it's a really neat city in so many ways. But I don't know. I, I never felt at home there in the natural environment uh, the way I do here. And I you know, I, that was part of what made me fall in love with this place. Um, you know, and part of it too is that as I was growing up for a few years, my dad lived in Maine. And so I would spend summers in Maine, um, you know, it's the rocky shorelines with conifers and so on. And, and so, boy, this place just speaks to my heart. So I can, I can totally deal with the, um, with the, with the dreary days. Awesome. Okay. All right. Well, here's a, here's a good one for you. The socio, the socioeconomics of the San Juans is undergoing change as people move here and telecommute. 
how will FSJ reach out to these new residents, many, many who may not have had much of a personal history of environmental concern as longer term community members? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and, and for those of you on the call, you know, there is, th this is a tourist destination and the advent of Airbnb and, and other internet based reservation systems have made it easier and easier for property owners to um, engage in that tourism industry. And, and what that means is that <clears throat> we've seen a really rapid proliferation of, of vacation rentals here. And that's just one piece of the puzzle. But you know, to take that one as an example, um, Friends of the San Juans is 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 getting engaged with that. Um, you know, there's a vacation rental working group of citizens here who has has been trying to tackle these issues and make recommendations to the county uh, about um, how to uh, work with the property owners and manage the growth in that industry in a thoughtful way that still preserves everything that we love about the islands, um, and. And the other, the other part of the question was, how is Friends of the San Juans reaching out to the people who arrive here who don't know anything, right? Um, and it's funny, that, it's funny that you say that in a way, because I, I sort of think of myself like I'm a recent arrival, you know? And I think so many people come here and they don't have that mentality of not it's it, it's sort of like well how can this place serve me right like how can i have a great piece of land or you know how can i like how can i get the most out of this place and and I, and and you know not to knock the folks who come here on vacation i did it myself for years and years but you know as i was arriving you know given my background perhaps it's not totally surprising but for me it was very much about you know how can i come here and make a difference right like how can I come here and be part of the solution rather than being part of the problem? Um, uh, anyway, I'm, I'm off track, but I just, you know, it, it's as people arrive here, how do they get educated? Um, and that's tricky. It's hard. You know, Friends of the San Juans has a booklet for new uh, property owners on the shoreline, and it's all about managing the shoreline to increase ecosystem function and, you know, don't put up a big bulkhead and, you know, just stuff like that. Um, it is, it is a challenge to reach everybody and we're not, not going to reach everybody, but we can try. And so, you know, we, we distribute that um, booklet to new homeowners. Um, and, you know, it's, that's, that's only part of the puzzle. Um, one of the things that we've got in the hopper for the coming year is a really big effort to help people who own property on the shoreline improve their shorelines. And we're going to be looking for people who um, want consultation on, you know, we, we've gotten grant money to do this and to um, reach out to shoreline property owners about the land that they have and how to improve it and how to make sure that it works well and that it's supporting the health of the land ecosystem and the marine ecosystem. And, um, you know, it's, 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 we've been doing a lot of thinking, honestly, about how do we find the people to, to do this work with? Um, and we're still figuring it out. Okay. Um, so that. You ready? Yeah. All right. So fire load in our local forest looms large given climate chaos. How can we address this as a community to make the island safer? Oh, this is a really good question. And I'm, I'm gonna be honest, it's something I only know a little bit about. This is, I, I know that it, is, it, that it is an issue and I haven't had the chance to really dig into this one too much. You know, I think part of, um, part of the work of the county's comprehensive plan is to look at land use issues and how we're managing those lands. And so there's gonna be a little bit of, of 
of the comp plan that I think will address this in some ways. Um, that's not enough. And I don't think I'm going to, I don't think I'm doing justice to your question, but this is something I'm going to have to learn more about and, and learn about how Friends of the San Juans, what, what Friends of the San Juans has already done on this and, and what are the opportunities on the horizon? Great. Um, I'm interested in projects that we can participate in, like the Susha project. Do you see some other projects where volunteers can participate? <laughs> you know, I'm laughing because this has been such a terrible year for that. <laughs> you know, I'd, like the Susha project is a great example. You know, our original plans had a ton of volunteer engagement, um, you know, to, to help with planting and with help with all these different aspects of the work. And it just wasn't safe. And we and we just couldn't, we weren't able to do that. We weren't able to incorporate the, um, the, the volunteerism on a large scale like we were hoping to because of safety, right? Like even though you're outside, you're still traveling to Susha together or you're, you know, like it's, you know, there's still exposure and we didn't want to, we didn't want people to take that risk. Um, so anyway, uh, the answer is yes, there's going to be, a, as, you know, as soon as we can, there's going to be a lot more opportunities for participating in restoration work. Um, and so on. You know, in the meantime, the volunteering, well, I think what you're asking about is like the hands-on stuff. And there's just a little bit right now. We've got some volunteers who are just finishing up some sampling of beaches for forage fish eggs. Uh, we have had a little bit of volunteerism in, in some of our restoration projects, but just a little bit. Um, you know, but, but man, coronavirus, like the end is in sight. And we are so excited not to just bring back the volunteer work that we love to do, but also the events. Like we, you know, our annual meeting a few weeks back had to be a virtual annual meeting for the first time ever. And oh my gosh, I mean, it went really well as a virtual meeting, but wouldn't it have been awesome to be together in person? So man, I'm with you. Whoever asked that question, thank you. I'm with you. I can't wait for, for the volunteer events to start back up. Yep, me neither. Okay, so are you planning on expanding partnership and education to central and eastern Washington, particularly in regard to salmon restoration? That's also a really good question. You know, um, okay, so I have a couple pieces to my answer there. One of the pieces of the answer is that I think that education and science education, environmental education is going to be a big thread of conversation in our strategic planning. And I think that we're going to be spending a lot of time figuring out what is our role in the, in the education landscape locally, regionally, statewide. So that's part one of my answer. And part two of my answer is that we've got something pretty exciting on the horizon. We have been working on a virtual reality lesson that helps students understand marine ecosystems. And if you're not familiar with virtual reality, it's you put these goggles on and you turn your head and it's like you're in the environment. There's actually a little screen in there that lets you, lets you turn and look around and look up and down. And um, uh, our, our staff member, Jeff Jess Newley has been out there filming these virtual reality experiences around the San Juan Islands. And we're just now developing the curriculum that goes with that so that kids can learn about marine food webs. And, and the conversation for us has been, if we pilot this locally, what are the opportunities to take this to a broader audience? And so, you know, it's funny you asked about Central and East Washington, because we actually were talking about this just the other day, like, you know, what is what would that mean if we took this program statewide and like what would the resource, you know, what kind of resources would we need to do that? Um, so that's that's something exciting that's on the horizon. Um, you know, we'll see. I, I think I think it might happen. Great. All right. So she says, Brent, I'm interested in potential problems in addressing spills of the new low sulfur marine fuels. And she said, you can ask level if you don't have the technical details. There's your out. <laughs> okay. But but yes, oil spills of that of the of the fuel is a problem. Ask the question again. What's the question about? So what are the problems? The potential problems 
in, ad in addressing spills of the new low sulfur, sulfur marine fuels. Yeah. The punchline here is that more research is needed. Um, to give a little bit of background to the folks who may not be familiar with this, you know, sulfur, the sulfur content in marine fuel is a pollutant and, and, and for air pollution. And the idea that big ships could use an alternative fuel that's, that's lower in sulfur uh, was really exciting to a lot of us in the environmental community. Um, and there have been regulations about, because this new, new fuel has been developed with lower levels of sulfur in it, and regulations have started requiring ships to use it under certain circumstances and so on. And this, is, this felt like a really um, positive step for shipping and, and the environmental impacts of shipping, right? And that's something that Friends of the San Juans keeps a very close eye on is, is the shipping that passes through these waters because we are, we are, we are the, 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 the place through which shipping travels when it comes from Canada to the rest of the world. Um, so this is really important to us. Now, you know, unfortunately, a recent spill of these fuels showed us, showed the community that these spills are actually harder to clean up than we thought they would be. And in terms of the viscosity and, and, and there's issues that have come to light about these new fuels. And, you know, this is, this is kind of cutting edge. We've been talking about this just in the last week, but um, there needs to be additional research done on these new low sulfur, low sulfur fuels to um, you know, find out what the pros and cons are and if there are spills, how are we gonna clean that up? And, and, and it gets at that bigger question of, you know, is this, is this really uh, a good idea to, to use these fuels? You know, what are the environmental trade-offs for that? And that's something we've been, you know, it, 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 it connects to, um, a terminal expansion we've been watching, which is just across the border in Canada called the Robert Banks Terminal 2, which is a, a terminal expansion that would allow for super large cargo ships to dock. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're on our email list, you've seen us offer a couple of opportunities to uh, comment on that and sign petitions and get engaged in that. But, you know, for instance, if these ships come, should they be required to use this fuel? Well, before these new problems arose, it seemed like a good idea, but now we're not so sure. And kind of that's where we're at right now. More research is needed. Thank you for asking that question. Okay. Okay. Um, this is actually, we might, might not be the last one. Hang on. There might be one more, but um, this is a good one too. Does Friends have any strategies to address local effects of climate change on sea level rise? This problem affects the transportation section of the comprehensive plan. Yes. Is that enough or do I need to say more? No, I'm kidding. So, <laughs> so climate change and the impacts of climate change are incredibly complex and as friends move into the next decade, like that's going to be top of mind. Like, like what can we do and how do we help, you know, what would, like, this is something for the strategic planning initiative that I'm really excited about. You know, let's have a conversation about what would it look like for the San Juan Islands to be a model community in terms of resiliency in the face of climate change, right? Um, and so one piece of that is, is the rise in sea level. Um, and it is, you know, I, well, okay, we've only got a few minutes left. I was gonna start talking about the impacts of sea level rise here. Um, the short answer is yes, we're thinking about that every day. I mean, just to take that Susha project as an example, what we did on Susha Island was remove a road that had been separating a, a, a salt marsh from the beach. And so now there is, now that that road has been removed, there's connectivity between the marsh and the beach, which improves that habitat for forage fish and for young salmon and, and so on. As we were going into that project, we wanted to make sure that the ecosystem function that we were restoring for that beach 
also would help that beach and that natural area be resilient in the face of rising seas. So that was built into our plans for that project. And, and that's just an example of how we're thinking about our work um, with respect to um, with rising sea levels. Yeah, so thank you for that. You know, I think we do have time for one more. And this is a good one as we kind of get into 2021. And you mentioned a few things already, but if you haven't mentioned anything, here you go. What areas of improvement would Brent like to see at Friends of the San Juans? What areas of improvement would I like to see at Friends of the San Juan? You know, I think, I, I, if I may, I, I, I want to uh, refer back to my earlier answer because the same things come to mind. You know, for me, the, the first step was getting our ducks in a row internally and making sure that as an organization, we are functioning really well uh, in terms of effectiveness and efficiency. Uh, I would like to see in the coming months and years us have a, have a uh, kind of create a set of priorities for our work over the next five years that will help us make sure that we are focusing our efforts where it's most needed and that we can really move the dial. Um, you know, and I, and I think uh, I, want, I, want to, I want to improve our communications. I want to improve our relationship with our community. You know, friends, you know, we're not going to please everybody, but at the same time, I feel like there's folks out there in the community who, you know, have, have felt, um, they felt disrespected by friends, you know, and I'm here to tell you that, that, you know, friends, friends is about neighbors supporting neighbors. It's not about neighbors versus neighbors. And, you know, I, there's a lot of different things that we do out there in the community. And, um, you know, I think everyone kind of finds their niche in terms of the, the different programs, what they, what they love about friends. We do so many different things out there in the community. And I want to be able to share those stories. I want to be able to share the impact. Um, you know, this is, as we, as we look ahead to the next five years, the next 50 years for the San Juan Islands, like the change is coming. And what can we do today to help make sure that our community and our ecosystems and the Salish Sea writ large are resilient and, and are ready for that? And how do we do that in a way that, you know, we're supporting each other? Because, this, you know, what gives me hope for the future is the connectedness of the people. You know, we are brilliant, energetic, and I say we meaning our community, the San Juan Islands. We have creativity and we have passion for this place that we all love. And, and how, do we bring, how do we bring all of these pieces together to, to, to ensure not just that we survive the coming challenges, but that we thrive during that time? That's that's what I that's my that's my hope and my vision for Friends of the San Juans. Great. Okay. Well, that how about that for perfect timing? <laughs> that there are no more questions. Um, but Brent, if, would you like to say anything before we head out tonight? Oh, I just want to say thank you so much to all of the people who showed up for this. You know, when we were planning this tonight, we didn't know if anybody would sign up to engage in this town hall. I wanna thank the folks who sent in the questions. Um, I hope I did them justice. And if I did not do them justice, I hope you'll follow up with me. My email is brent at sanwans.org. You know, reach out to me and let's let's continue the conversation. You know, as we, as we go into the coming months and, and early 2021, there's gonna be a lot of opportunities to engage with with our work as we go through strategic planning with the county and the comp plan and, and, and soon those volunteer opportunities will open back up and we can get lots of people engaged that way too. And oh my gosh, I look forward to meeting people in person. I have met so many people via Zoom. I can't wait to have like in-person meetings, but, but thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. And thank you, Katie and Michelle for helping set this up.
if you're still with us. I, I'm not sure if this is true for everyone, but Katie has kind of frozen up for me. So I'll say good night and thank you again. Thanks for joining us tonight. We'll talk to you soon. Hmm. Hi. I don't know if you if you knew that, Katie, but you froze up there for a minute or two. So I say good night to you on your behalf and Perfect. I think people are freaking out. Good. I was panicking. I'm like, what's going on? Still watch. Everyone's still watching. Oh, good. Okay, everyone's still on. So well, I'm back to say good night too then. <laughs> All right, go, go technical difficulties, but but yeah, so everyone, so you were all set, Brent? Yeah. Okay. Thank you all so, so much for coming tonight. I'm glad I did get to say good night one more time. And I, I hope you all have really happy holidays too. Good night.